Welcome everyone. I'm Maria Crowley with NASHA. And we're going to get things started. All right. A little bit about our organization um, as we begin. In case you don't know us, if you're not familiar with us, the National Association of State Head Injury Administrators um, is a national trade organization. We're a nonprofit and we are created to assist state government in promoting partnerships and building systems that meet the needs of individuals with brain injury and their families. And we take that very seriously. We're very passionate about that. NASHA provides a number of different services and supports to our members and to folks all over the United States. Um, we keep our fingers as best we can on the pulse of what is currently happening in the world of brain injury and provide a lot of resources um, to that end. Uh, we are involved with training and professional development in a number of different ways, including this particular learning opportunity. Uh, we connect states with their federal partners and states, states in their own um, states um, so that they can better serve people with brain injury. We provide a wealth of um, different kinds of technical assistance. And uh, last but not least, we do a lot of work in the advocacy space, both at the national level and again at the state level. Today, we're gonna talk a little bit about our Leading Practices Academy, and in particular, about the Leading Practices Academy that involves behavioral health. So these are the things we're gonna run through with you today, and we're gonna have plenty of time at the end for some questions um, and answers. Um, but we will start with introducing ourselves and giving you a little bit of background on what the LPA is, um, a little bit more information on what that means related to the behavioral health LPA, some expectations of us and of people that um, apply to our LPA, and then we'll gauge some interest from you as to whether or not this is something you think is right for you and your program and some ways to help fund the LPA. So that's where we're headed. Uh, this is our team. Uh, I'm Maria Crowley with NASHA. I'm the Academy Advisor. You have Caitlin Sinovec with you. She directs our LPA. And Haley Cushion with NASHA manages all the things for us. So we're very glad that you're here with us. Um, we, just to have a little background for you, um, we provide professional development as kind of a spectrum of services from some one and once and done webinars on a topic. It's very didactic. We do a deeper dive with some of our workshops where it's more related to skills building. But over the years, we've had states ask us for more, particularly related to topics and how they can better dig in and do some systemic partnering and policy and um, interventions related to those topics. So we created our Leading Practices Academy, of which we have two. Uh, the first was related to the criminal legal system and brain injury. And this particular one, which is our first love, which is related to behavioral health. Now, I'm going to turn things over to my partner, Caitlin. Great. Thank you so much, Maria, for that introduction. So I'm going to walk us through kind of the why around why NASHA really is invested in doing this Leading Practices Academy and what we're seeing states be able to do as a result of this. So go ahead and to the next slide, please. So when we're talking about behavioral health, there's a lot of definitions floating around there. So we landed on this definition, which is from the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration. So when we're talking about behavioral health, we're talking about um, inclusive of the promotion of mental health, resilience, and well-being, the treatment of mental health and substance use disorders, and support for those who experience recovery or are experiencing these conditions are in recovery from these conditions along with their families and communities. So as you can see, multi layers and levels, what we're talking about with behavioral health. Next slide. 
So behavioral health and brain injury, if you're familiar with the brain injury world, some of this is not going to be a surprise to you, but there's a really strong connection between behavioral health and brain injury. Behavioral health conditions can exist for individuals prior to having a brain injury, and in some cases can be a risk factor for brain injury. I think one of the more prominent ones um, that we're seeing a lot in our communities around substance use is especially thinking about overdose. And overdose isn't a mild anoxic injury, sometimes more than mild injury, and that can be a risk risk factor for folks. Um, we also know that people just across the population have behavioral health needs. Many of us have experienced some sort of behavioral health need, diagnosis or treatment at some point in our lifetime, that it is then likely that those individuals may also have a brain injury because people with behavioral health needs exist. Um, what is not surprising then I think to folks in the brain injury world is we know that behavioral health can be a result behavioral health diagnoses can be a result of the brain injury, right? We see the data about a third of individuals have some sort of mental health symptom six to 12 months post injury. And we also know that there's an increased risk factor for attempt or death by suicide for those who have had a brain injury. Next slide. And so going into some of the data, this is a snapshot of what we know with the numbers and with anything with brain injury and behavioral health, I think the numbers underrepresent really the scope of the issue. But again, just compared with the general population, we see that people uh, who've had a brain injury are more than seven times more likely to have a suicidal thought and three to four times more likely to have an attempt of some sort, which is pretty significant. We know folks who have a history of brain injury are much more likely to experience alcohol use or abuse, illicit drug use, or both. Um, then again, the general population. And again, 30% of um, brain injury survivors experience some sort of mental health symptom. 85% of families report behavioral health changes. Um, and that's comparable, that's almost double to the general population when we're thinking about the numbers there. So the need for behavioral health supports and services is really much higher among our brain injury survivor population than the general population. Next slide. Um, and within that, then we have a lot of subpopulations, and these are folks that we know are more at risk for having co-occurring brain injury and behavioral health needs. And Maria, I think you can click through a couple of times here. I got fancy with the animations. Um, but there are these subpopulations where brain injury rates and prevalence is much, much higher than the general population and just our general brain injury survivor population. So if we're looking at folks experiencing homelessness, survivors of domestic or interpersonal violence, people who are incarcerated, people who have survived adverse childhood experiences, globally just living in poverty increases your risk for having brain injury and behavioral health needs, and then veterans. So the data really supports all of these populations um, that they have much, much higher needs of integrated behavioral health and brain injury services. These are also populations that are much more likely to be underdiagnosed or underidentified as having a brain injury and therefore more challenging engaging in the appropriate supports and services and are going to have more long term impacts because of that. Next slide. And so, you know, kind of a chicken or the egg question, right? Like it, what is contributing to what? They're both, right? And so having a pre-existing behavioral health diagnosis can impact recovery from a brain injury because of biological factors, social economic factors, available resources surrounding that. Um, but we also know that if there is behavioral health needs after brain injury, it can impact someone's ability to engage in treatment access treatment services or get everything that they need met. And we find these siloing of systems where whatever is most prominent gets sort of referred and supported like, oh, they have a brain injury, they need brain injury services. But then the mental health piece, maybe that underlying depression isn't necessarily treated. And we see that in reverse too, right? Folks who have really prominent behavioral health needs sometimes are then excluded from rehabilitation services. Like, oh, let's fix the psych issues before we do that. Then we know that that's actually not what's best for the individual. Next slide. Um, and again, just really enforcing that this is correlational. I spoke about the overdose risk, right? And so because we can't really identify like this is first, then that, what we really need are integrated systems um, to really collaborate and allow folks to get the services that they need when they need them. Next slide. 
Um, and also wanted to bring in the idea of trimorbidities, right? So people with behavioral health conditions broadly are also more likely to experience chronic physical health conditions. That likelihood then increases when there's a brain injury involved, right? We know that folks with brain injury are also more likely to experience chronic physical health conditions as a result of the brain injury. Um, and so when we have those complex factors of physical health, behavioral health, cognitive and brain injury needs, um, it makes it harder for the person to manage them and to be able to live at the quality of life that they want to be living in their community. Um, and unfortunately, people with behavioral health conditions are more likely to experience stigma in healthcare services and are therefore less likely to access needed medical care services. So people have these extra needs and it's harder for them to get them or harder for them to get them equitably. And we know what happens when people don't get the services that they need, um, that the outcomes are just not as good. Next slide. So we know the data is there, that this is a need, that people need behavioral health and brain injury services. We know that people are not necessarily accessing or getting equitable treatment within those services. Um, and we know that they're siloing, right? Brain injury providers are really good at brain injury and maybe don't feel as equipped to address behavioral health, especially when it is not specific to, you know, kind of that immediate post brain injury um, symptomology. We also know that behavioral health providers are not always comfortable with brain injury. We say brain injury and cognition, and they're like, oh, I don't do that. And what we have is people kind of getting referred back and forth to each other. That's the challenge. And again, at the end of the day, we make it more complicated for people to get the services that they need. So therefore, that brings us to our LPA on behavioral health and brain injury, um, is to think about how we can increase brain injury awareness and education for providers. And similarly, um, be able to support those working in brain injury services to know how to address behavioral health needs and in the reverse behavioral health providers to know how to address brain injury um, through education and training. And we're going to talk through what that looks like kind of within the LPA in our next couple of slides. So next one, Maria. Um, so, you know, providing the solutions, we know that there's some momentum right now. Um, you know, it's Policy work is policy work, but there is funding going to states around addressing behavioral health needs, building out the behavioral health workforce, you know, and we're making glacial movements, but we are moving around integrated healthcare systems where people can get what they need and don't have to sort of do this hopping around that happens. Um, we know that there are some emerging best practices around integrating behavioral health and brain injury services. Um, but if you're new to that and new to thinking about that, it's you know, challenging to necessarily identify where do I start? Who do I talk to? When we say behavioral health system, we're talking about a whole scope of services, providers, settings, right? Um, it can be really challenging and overwhelming to think of like, how would we even get started with this? Who do we need to target? Where are people getting services? Um, and then in some cases, what do we do about that, right? Maybe we do know brain injury really well, but we're not so sure about behavioral health and how to necessarily support those providers. Um, so that is what this LPA is for. This LPA is really to be able to provide you intensive technical assistance, collaboration with other states doing similar work to help you identify and implement a plan to improve outcomes for individuals with brain injury and behavioral health in your state. Next slide. So this is our model that we've put together. We call it the systemic impact model, which is um, based on um, a couple of different resources, one used by the, I'm sorry, Haley, this is not the correct term, the, the juvenile justice LPA has a different name. Um, they have an impact model and we base this off of the administration on community living's behavioral health guide. So it's sort of integrating some, some good practices of, around the approach for building out systems to serve individuals. And you can go to the next slide, Maria. So we use this model and states can identify what um, step of the model they really want to focus on. And sometimes it's more than one step. As you can see, they're probably interrelated for a lot of people of really where they want to focus on in their LPA year in their 12 month time. Right. So entering in the LPA, part of the, the need is to have partners on board or to be really close to having those partners on board that bringing them into the LPA is kind of that tipping point of, yes, let's do something. Let's let's pilot something together. Um, with those partners then, and generally those are a behavioral health partner, um, either state level or local level, it looks a lot of different ways. The different aspects of really building out these systems are 
we start with focusing on training. And I think that's the part that's very familiar to a lot of people around that brain injury 101. What is a brain injury? Helping providers understand what that is. What is the prevalence? Why do we need to be doing it in behavioral health services? What is the overlap, right? Kind of a more in depth of the five slides I presented right before this. After that training piece often is, okay, I have awareness. I know that this is an issue. What do I do about it? Um, and introducing screening tools. So something like the OBIS to be able to screen for the prevalence of brain injury, identify who's struggling with that potentially in the community who might need resources or tailored interventions. That leads us to our middle step there of intervention, where we're equipping providers to be able to provide appropriate interventions when there is that comorbidity of brain injury and behavioral health. And that can be a range of things from frontline providers, such as case managers, outreach workers, all the way to your psychiatrists who are prescribing information. The intervention aspect of it is really honing in and equipping the behavioral health workforce to be able to intervene and provide services really well to folks with brain injury. All of those things are well and good and really focused on those direct providers, you know, working face to face with individuals. But again, at state level, we know that um, we can equip individual people, but sometimes what's needed is systems level and policy level change. So that systems level change is sort of creating, you know, brain injury informed or neurologic informed services and that might be at a specific site or that might be in a chain of services right if there's um, sort of a, a statewide community mental health agency making sure how do we make that organization accessible to folks with brain injury and making those systems level changes from referral sources and progress to collaboration across partnerships um, you know integrating brain injury screening into all aspects of care there's a lot of different things that that can look like um, but that's really thinking about uh, sustainability and integrating and weaving into processes the next level up from that then is policy and we well know that policy influences a lot <laughs> of what we are able to do what we're not able to do what is funded what continues on after a pilot year and so sometimes that is the focus of the LPA work is to really identify and influence policy. Um, and sometimes that happens co-occurring with doing some of these other things, right? Brain injury screening gives us data to help inform and influence policy changes. So those are sort of our five steps through the model. Again, it's a 12 month time and we know that change is, is slow and systems change is hard. So typically states will pick one or two of these as their focus for that one behavioral health year or that LPA year um, and to be able to really hone in and focus in on that. Although we do touch on all aspects of that um, throughout our, our meetings together and technical assistance. So let's dive into what that looks like. Next slide, Maria. Um, so what is the LPA when we you know, are talking about the Leading Practices Academy, what do we mean? So this includes strategic and customized technical assistance. You as uh, whoever the lead is will meet with our NASHA team once a month um, and alternating in those calls will also meet with your partners to really help that collaborative team building. Um, we also have quarterly peer to peer sessions. So that is sessions. Um, there's all states academies where everybody involved in the LPA comes, the leads, the partners, and we have um, subject matter experts that come and present and talk about specific topics related to the LPA work and to really help you be able to implement your project and program in your state. Um, we also have meetings where it's just the leads, all of the states have a chance to come together and again, kind of hive mind. Um, we have a B theme with this, but really being able to share what's happening in your state, what are you finding that's working, what are challenges, and being able to learn from each other um, in those sessions. So it's a lot of learning and engagement locally with your own community and your own state with other states involved in the LPA and then typically with national experts being able to talk about that. We also have a hub of resources, which is, you know, kind of a dump of all of the things that relate to each of those steps of the systemic impact model. We have POPs, which are recorded sessions that are available to view anytime um, that include things from uh, subject matter experts around a range of topics that again help supplement the work that you're doing. Um, and then we also include a kickoff meeting and annual summit that involves subject matter experts as well as each other to be able to learn. So the cost for the LPA is $10,000 and that includes all of these things that I just spoke about um, and it includes the 12 months of the Leading Practice Academy. Next slide. 
So what are the roles and expectations? Your NASHA team um, will connect with you. Um, we'll meet with the staff lead. As I mentioned, every month we have a monthly TA call. Um, we can support you in identifying who the partners need to be, your stakeholders. We develop a work plan for every state, and we use that work plan to guide the work of the project, check in on progress towards goals, um, identify what needs to happen with the individual state group, as well as what homework NASHA needs to do to support you all um, in developing that plan and what that can look like. Um, we review that work plan throughout the year when we meet at those monthly meetings. Um, we can help identify subject matter experts as needed, facilitate those communications and connections, um, depending on what the focus of your LPA is. Um, and we can coordinate all of the LPA activities so that the scheduling stuff and the calendaring, you all just have to accept those Zoom links that come from Haley. Um, and sometimes you have homework to prepare for that, but it's all for all to move things along and to make progress there. Um, and then again, we have those online resources that we provide and can push some things out there like this is really relevant to what you're doing this is a great webinar that you should attend or we've got this located in our hub please come find you know and review this information there next slide um, and then for you as a participant, should you choose to join our LPA um, next year, one of the things that we need from you all is to identify a lead staff or a primary contact. And this is the person that kind of makes that final call, like if we're developing a work plan together, confirming that and saying, yes, this reflects the goals that we want for the year, um, identifying those partners and making sure those partners understand what they're doing, what their participation in the LPA is, what the expectations are. Um, oftentimes states need to convene in between those monthly meetings to really make things move forward. And the lead is that person to be able to do that. Your role as the lead also is to identify who those initial partners need to be. Again, we can do some of that brainstorming together in the LPA, but it's good to come on board, you know, with one or two folks that are really um, interested and invested in the project that you're doing. You may otherwise spend the year developing partnerships, which is fine, um, but, you know, in terms of moving forward in that training um, intervention piece of it, it's good to have partners at the table to get things started. Um, You'll engage in the work plan development um, that's facilitated by NASHA, right? We wanna make sure that the goals that are in that work plan are reflective of you, your community, um, and what you wanna see accomplished within that LPA year. Our job is to help organize that um, and make sure that it's feasible, but you know, we want that to come from you and be driven by your community and state. Um, your other responsibilities are, again, to engage with us, you know, help respond and, and connect with folks if we're having trouble with that. Um, accepting those Zoom invites is one of the responsibilities and coming to the meetings, um, and then participating in all those LPA activities, the peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, the all-state academy sessions. Um, and then again, you're, you know, what you're paying for in this LPA is the technical assistance and also the resources that we pull together for you all. So making sure that you're utilizing those and, and seeking those out, sharing those with your partners as relevant, um, and making sure folks, again, understand what the LPA is and, and what you're trying to do there. Um, next slide. So these are just some examples of the previous year, and I've, I've kind of um, assigned what aspects of that model these projects really focused on for that year. Again, you know, there's a lot of blurred lines between these things as one um, leads into the other, but these are some of the things that states have worked on over the past a um, couple of years that we have been doing this particular LPA. Um, so a state uh, identified and uh, initiated an online course around brain injury training that was then accessible to providers across the state, mental health and behavioral health providers accessible across the state for them to be able to take those online learning courses, right? So that really, you know, developing a training curriculum for folks to learn more about serving people with brain injury. Um, a lot of people are talking about screening, which is great. That's really important. Um, and so a lot of them have worked to implement screening throughout different types of behavioral health agencies from um, community-based mental health centers and also into inpatient state psychiatric facilities. So definitely across the spectrum and range um, with youth and family systems as well as adult systems. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of states that have then focused on that intervention piece around really equipping their behavioral health workforce to be able to address the needs of individuals with brain injury within their services um, through those interventions, through therapy interventions and um, psychiatry interventions. And then there's, um, you know, a couple of states that have focused on that higher level systems and policies and, you know, one of which was really figuring out a roadmap 
of gaps between all of these different entities and services that all exist and are all state funded, um, you know, what are the holes that people are falling into? Why are they falling in there? How do we build those bridges across that? Um, and how do we then put forward a plan to be able to address those gaps? So you can see kind of a broad range of focus focuses, is that the plural, foci um, <laughs> of the LPA that really can touch on where you are with your state and what um, partners you have on board. Again, this is an example of some of the state partner agencies that folks have um, been able to work with. Again, child welfare and family services, all the way to state psychiatric facilities, state department of behavioral health, residential recovery. There's a whole range. Um, and as you know, these states identified one or two of those. Okay, very important to note. They didn't just say, we're going to work with our state behavioral health system, except for that systems change one, then they did, but all of those partners were on board to be able to do that. Um, focusing on one of these areas to really pilot and implement um, for an effective year. And then I think I'm turning it over to Maria now to talk about strategies for funding your involvement. <laughs> Thank you. So often we get the question related to um, different ways that um, states or programs can look for funds to be involved in the Leading Practices Academy. And so we put a um, list together for states and programs to consider as they're thinking through what that might look like to just give um, people some ideas about um, how to support it financially. Um, for some of our LPA um, participants, they have an existing traumatic brain injury grant um, through the Administration for Community Living. If behavioral health, which is a broad umbrella, as Caitlin has shared with you already and talked about, um, if behavioral health is a part of the work that you're doing as a grantee, um, you can certainly tie that to your current activities, and that may be a funding source for you. Um, often participants will take a look at the possibility of blended funding. Are there other partners that can help share that cost? Um, we know from experience that sometimes when people have a vested interest financially, they may tend to possibly, you know, partner with you better. It's sort of a put your money where your mouth is approach. So it's certainly within the realm of consideration to talk with your state mental health system or some piece of that system that might want to share some of the um, funding supports with you, um, your community health providers, possibly your state protection and advocacy program through um, NDRN or the National Disability Rights Center. Every state has a protection and advocacy program they definitely are focused on behavioral health and brain injury, might be able to help support this financially. Your veterans affairs folks might also be interested in partnering with you. Um, an entity that occurs to me that has participated in the LPA before that is not on this list might be your University Centers for Excellence in Developmental Disability or your USAID. Um, they have some flexibility with funds and may also be interested in partnering with you to take a look at um, behavioral health across disability groups even. Um, possibly there may be some new sources of revenue that you can um, look at, apply for, and secure funds to move forward, or funds that sent outside of your program that um, maybe your department or another department has access to like opioids funding or grants through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or SAMHSA um, and various foundations, state or private foundations that you can look to, you know, to help support. So there's a number of strategies to put in place. And, you know, as I mentioned before, it might be a way to really um, get people to come to the table with you and really support the work that you want to do with this. So I believe we're turning things over to Haley. Right. Thank you, Maria. Um, and we really appreciate everyone's attention and um, focusing on this um, it's really important matter with uh, those with brain injury. Um, I put a link in the chat. This is our interest form. If you are interested in um, joining our LPA or interested in more information or talking with us further, 
uh, please do complete this form and uh, we'll be in touch or um, let you know that you've been accepted to the LPA. Uh, Maria, you can go to the next slide. Um, we will need to know, uh, just for your information, when you complete the form, we will need to know um, who you are, what you're hoping to achieve, or uh, goals that maybe you anticipate uh, being able to achieve in the LPA, uh, the population that you wish to reach, a list of partners or potential partners, and um, your funding source or um, funding sources. Um, and if you would like some more information about um, uh, funding strategies, we'll be happy to meet with you and talk through some of those ideas as well. Next slide. All right, uh, we have more information at this link. Um, I will put that in the chat as well. Um, and if uh, there's just some information there, there's our uh, flyer, which I'll add to this, um, to the chat as well. Um, and you can reach out if you have more information or more questions. Next. All right, there is my email address. Um, I'm happy to um, take your questions and then uh, give them to Caitlin or Maria or whoever is most appropriate to answer your questions. Um, I will let you know that um, if you need to um, look at some creative ways for funding or for payments, we're um, happy to talk through those as well. We do get that question, so I figured I'd go ahead and answer it for you all. Um, and I think that's it. I think we're turning it over to you all for any questions you may have. Hi. My Hi. name is Brett. How are you, ladies and men? <laughs> Doing fine. How are you? Good. So, Caitlin, you mentioned many. Um, I, I won't go too deep here because I know I should probably just email, but it'll help me set the stage. You mentioned, Caitlin, many times the word state. And I'm thinking, you know, of Ohio, Indiana, or Michigan. Can a university as well be focused at at that level? More of a more of a silo effect in a certain city that the university resides in. I'm looking at Maria. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. We use the word state with a small s and a big s. It just depends on um what we're talking about but absolutely i'm intrigued at the direction you are interested in heading yeah i i don't want to encompass the whole meeting and and put it out there what we're doing um and maybe that's better for the uh, questionnaire and, and, and unless you want me to share but i want to be careful with brian and Teresa and other p folks who may have a question We do have a few minutes if you want to share it and then we can. Sure. Yeah. So um, in Dayton, Ohio, I'm not sure if you know where everyone that is or close to Cincinnati, Ohio, that helps. The University of Dayton, Wright State University, St. Clair Community College, and the Greater Dayton Foundation um, has granted us um, significant amount of money to focus on TBI, traumatic brain injury in the Dayton area, which goes all the way almost to Toledo and almost all the way down to Cincinnati, to Columbus, Ohio, and over to Indiana. So you can kind of get a ballpark of that. And our initiative is fourfold. Um, one, we do research with the area hospitals all the way from Ohio State um, to the Dayton area to Indianapolis, even in Chicago a little bit. We work with associations that affect individuals with alcohol and drug abuse, the Goodwill Easter sales, and then finally professional education. And there's our need. We're finding out, my background's business, but I'm helping here as a fellow. We're finding out that nurses, teachers, K through 12, um, college professors, um, they don't know how to recognize, and then once they recognize TBI in their classroom or in a patient, how to proceed. So one of the things I thought this money would be used for um, on this LPA would be the training and the screening to better um, educate individuals. That's a high level, 10,000 foot. Thank you for that um, overview and um, um, that is right up the alley of what the LPA can can help with. So we'd definitely be interested in talking to you more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll let someone else talk. Sure. <laughs>
while we wait for questions for folks, Brett, I have been to Dayton, Ohio, if that helps you. I have, <laughs> I'm not from Ohio, but I have been to Dayton a couple of times. So yeah, know where you are on the map and um, yeah, a lot of good work in, in Ohio in general happening and kind of exciting to hear about this education focus, I think, for, for some of what you're doing. I'll put the web page on there as well. Thank you, Caitlin. Great. Any other questions or anyone else, you know, again, want to kind of throw out what you may be thinking about and um, yeah, we're happy to answer them. Or any barriers that we might could do a little problem solving related to. The number of hours. <laughs> is, is, is it, it, do you consider it a full-time position? Uh, more of a facilitator, project management person working with these groups? I, I I think it's variable. I mean, a lot of folks, it's just the LPA in some ways kind of enhances or intensifies what is already maybe part of the work that they're doing, which is often why we talk about like the state or the state lead, because it's like a lead agency that's focused on brain injury that wants to build out these collaborations or partnership. Um, I think a, like a project facil facilitator it is a good way of describing it. It's not going to probably take 40 hours of your work week, but I think it does as the lead person, it is time in part to make things happen in between meetings, right? So our, in general, in terms of hours of engagement with us, you know, it's usually between, you know, one to five hours a month kind of adding in the meetings, but we know that that's not enough time to actually make wheels turn on these things. And so Beyond that, the time is really about, you know, convening or working on it or making some of those things happen, putting together the training or putting together the presentation about screening and why screening. So oftentimes that work overlaps a lot with what people maybe already fo are focusing on in their day to day work. And the LPA is a way to help guide that, enhance that, bring in resources and information um, around that. And you know, in some cases, being part of the LPA, like, facilitates that participation. I think Maria spoke to this a little bit. It formalizes, like, hey, we're participating in this. We need you all to come. We need work groups on this. We need to make this happen and sort of moves it from, yeah, that's a good idea to an actual project because there's a timeline um, around that. Just as people, we all re respond <laughs> to timestamps on things. And so sometimes that can be a good way to facilitate something everybody wants to do. Like, hey, we're part of this, let's let's do that, so. It can take as much or as little time as you have to devote to it. I definitely think it's good to have someone, at least a someone that's dedicated to the work um, because you wanna make things happen. 12 months seems like a long time, but it goes by incredibly quickly. And you want to have made some inroads, if at all possible, um, in that amount of time. So it does help to have somebody that's specifically dedicated to the work. Thank you. Helpful. When does it start? January 1st? August. It will, yes, it will start uh, middle uh, to later in the month of August. And it'll end up, um, we typically end up late July of the next year. Can you give an example of some tools? You mentioned tools and support. I mean, do you have a conglomerate of educators and uh, technology people, social media people on your staff that that supports this, these initiatives? I mean, yes, Mary, I don't know if you want to jump in. I was going to say we have just sort of start, starting out with resources and tools. We have a lot of examples of things like survey. This is a survey that, you know, we've used with providers to get their understanding of what brain injury is. And then, you know, you can kind of tailor that. Or we have infographics that are sort of preset available to folks in the LPA that you can tailor to help kind of build out the message. Um, I mean, I think our brains hold a lot of that in terms of just that national scope and perspective of like, this is, you know, this is a training plan that's been implemented in this place. This is what it looked like and and how these folks tailored it and how it responded to that. Um, so I think that's, 
in addition to the resources that are pulled into the hub around, you know, here's the publications that are useful, here's um, videos or SMEs on the experts that, you know, you can kind of dive into that. But Maria had a response, so I'm going to throw it to her now too. And it, you know, because it's such a broad, when you say behavioral health, it's such a broad um, topic. It Some of those resources, you know, depend on what specific area a program wants to hone in on. Um, some of the expertise comes from people, subject matter experts. Some come from training resources or written resources that we have. Some we develop as we go. I'll also add that the uh, principles of practices or the POPs that Caitlin mentioned earlier are subject matter experts that um, have given us permission to have recorded on-demand uh, foundational um, information to provide to you, including how to incorporate screening in behavioral health care, uh, how to incorporate screening for traumatic brain injury in behavioral health care, also, how to train the um, non-brain injury expert or provider. Um, and we also have information about program evaluation, outcomes, uh, measuring impact of your work. Um, and then, um, so we, we have a lot of this information that is only available to our LPA participants um, in a, a system that we call NASHA Learn that you'll get a login for and have this on-demand access to all of our sessions throughout the year and these extra foundational tools. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else have any other questions or Anything else that we can help describe a little bit further or examples we can share? I'll also put it out there that if anyone is needing a um, um, a recommendation or would like to uh, talk to a state that has um, been involved in one of our LPAs before and would like to connect with um, a past participant uh, to, to ask them questions. We'll be happy to connect you with someone to, to kind of give you a little bit more um, insight of maybe some of the work they did and uh, maybe ask questions to a peer uh, that has been through the process. If while you're doing your grocery shopping or driving to work, you have a question, uh, please do uh, uh, record my email address, hcushion at nasha.org, and um, let us know if you have any questions that come up. We'll send out this recording as well as some information uh, for, for follow-up um, if you're interested. And um, please do share um, this information with others who may be interested and, and really do think um, how we can best help you and in, in your goals with your organization. Thank you. Very helpful. Good, good. We enjoy it. It's something we're very passionate about. And it's been um, really just so delightful to see how people work through their LPA and really create some momentum and some um, really solid partnerships from it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, and we do have some states that stay on for several rounds of the LPA to continue their work um, and implementation and, and sustain um, the work that they've done. So um, that's exciting. And we think it's a, a good compliment to us that, that they decided to stick around for several years. So I, I, I sent to you, uh, Maria, our uh, um, our web page. Did it did it uh, show up for you? Let me see. I just sent it to you. And now I'm sending it to Caitlin. I didn't know if I should do it for everyone. I felt like I'm taking too much everyone's time. Did that come through email? I no, chat, chat. I don't see it in the. 
Don't see it. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're welcome to put it in the chat to everyone. Sure. Okay. There you go. There it is. Some of you may have heard of the University of Dayton, Ohio. It's great. Thank you so much for sharing. This is an initiative that's been going on, actively going on a year and a half. The strategy started uh, three years ago, and they get a fellow every year for three years. I'm the first fellow where I'm supporting the initiative. There's a lot here. Yeah, if you click on the Padlet, Maria, which is about three-fourths down, there's 125 resources just in the Dayton area that we funnel individuals to, we call TBI survivors, of how to progress forward. But the problem is we need an AI tool around this Padlet because it's overwhelming, you know, when you leave, I don't have a TBI, thank God, but when you leave, where do you start? Um, so, um, and then we have the four work groups that I talked about, education, continuum of care, uh, research. We also have a student board that does research as well. Uh, the person behind this uh, is not me, <laughs> uh, it's Dr. Susan Davies. Um, so that name I know. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Awesome. She okay. She's a person that I report to. Uh, she's pictured there um, about halfway down to the right of the gentleman. Uh, kind of blonde hair there. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that. Okay. I'll be reaching out to you that filling out the questionnaire and definitely reviewing this with Susan, Dr. Davies. Great. Right. Right, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Yes, ma'am. Well, it was her suggestion. <laughs> She's the one that got the information. She's at a chair meeting or something. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you. I'll fill out the questionnaire and go from there. Perfect. Yeah, and thank you, everyone. We really appreciate your time today. Um, if you have any questions, please do reach out. Caitlin and Maria, do you have anything else? I don't think so, but again, I know that this was kind of info dumped on you, um, which is like the opposite of best practices and cognitive strategies. So please review the information that comes out and reach out to us if you have questions or if you would like to just kind of talk through, as Brett did today, if you'd start to generate ideas and talk through what it could maybe look like for your state, we're happy to do that with you. So great. Well, thank you, everybody. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.